sees that uh, there is absolutely no emulsion removed from either side of the x-ray. They're both very smooth, and yet there's an obvious uh, sort of scratching into the... The gouge, uh, the gouge into the x-ray, which should be present if it were authentic, but isn't. Right, which, which on proves its own... all by itself that it's a copy. Well, right, which on its own would not be an oddity because x-ray technicians and other doctors handling them often scratch x-rays uh, right. sometimes with purpose and sometimes yeah. by accident. But the fact is, if you have no emulsion removed from either side and you have something present that was obviously uh, there by the removal of emulsion, then you, then you quite frankly have proof that it's a copy. That's right. So that's bizarre enough. <laughs> no, that's you absolutely know. right. Very good. Very nice. And uh, you don't need to be a doctor to think about that one, and you don't need to have a Ph.D. to think about that one. That's just a simple matter of common sense. If, yeah, if yeah, something yeah, 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 constructed yeah. that way, then, uh, you know, yeah, of course, I'm, I'm very familiar with uh, with uh, David Mantic's work. Um, David, David's here in Madison, Wisconsin right now uh, for six weeks, and we're, um, we've got together a couple of times already, and we'll be getting together again on Wednesday. Oh, great. Um, is he going to do one of these shows also? Uh, yes, yes, I do want to interview him, though we were thinking of discussing uh, Peter Janney's book, Mary's Mosaic, and uh, he has his his own inscribed copy he wanted to have. His wife is coming for a visit. She may bring it with him, so we, that may happen, yes. <laughs> Very good. I'd like to hear David's view on that. Uh, it's a wonderful book. Uh, well, you know... I, Again, though, you know, with, when it comes to uh, examining all these materials, I'll tell you again, I, I always search for common themes. And the common theme here with all of the evidence, whether it be the, the medical evidence, uh, witness testimony, uh, photographs, it seems as though there is absolutely nothing with a clear chain of custody. There's absolutely nothing that doesn't seem to have been tampered with, either intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, you know, and it's not a matter of sheer incompetence. It's far too... No, it's, yeah, uh, it's quite the opposite. Yeah, it's very clear all this was deliberately mismanaged, breaking all the chains of custody so that no one could possibly ever be punished for their involvement in the assassination of JFK. Well, I've always felt that that was an absolute... Uh, that was the best way to make sure that there would never be a clear-cut story about any of this. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you, you mentioned 9-11, and although I... I, I do uh, differ from a lot of people's views on that, and I don't feel as though it was as intricately uh, created as some do. The fact is that, again, you have another situation where there is nothing but misdirection and mishandling and the disappearance of and et cetera, et cetera. It is exactly the same type of handling of all the evidence again. And, uh, you know, what does this tell us? This has always been my, you know, my position. What does this tell us? If the people that are supposed to be in charge of collecting that evidence and presenting the truth to us have absolutely no interest in presenting the truth to us, then that means that the reality must be far uglier than, than the fairy tale. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No doubt and about it. it. No doubt it, about it. No doubt it, about it. It would certainly be bad enough if the Secret Service incompetence, let's just say, or complicity, or any of combination thereof, which, in my opinion, the only guy that day who was absolutely doing his job was Clint Hill, uh, you know, and he seemed to be the only person who reacted correctly during the shooting and everything else. Um, yeah, yeah, have you ever read his testimony about what he did uh, during those few moments in Dealey Plaza? Mm -hmm. I certainly yeah. have, and you're... you're you quite aptly point out that it, it disagrees with the Sapruder film. <laughs> right. uh, and it always has. And he has not changed his story. He is not one of these guys whose stories has evolved over the years. Right. And, uh, and he absolutely sticks by it. But the, the odd question for me with him is that I know very well that he's seen the Sapruder film. Uh, it was even used as, as an aid when he was brought back to instruct other Secret Service agents about things uh, later on. I mean, he did have a bit of a career after JFK. And, uh, and even so, I find it quite remarkable that he never uh, acknowledges the differences. 
Well, he's clearly been induced to say that he believes there was only one shooter and three shots, which is obviously not the case. And anyone who was in the situation he was in knows better. After all, he reported, you know, not only getting up on the back of the vehicle, pushing Jackie down, laying across their bodies, looking down into this fist-sized hole in the back of JFK's head, and then turning and giving a thumbs down to his colleagues in the Secret Service, all before the limousine reached the triple underpass. And from some of Kellerman's testimony, he reports also looking back and seeing Clint Hill lying across the trunk, which actually I take to have been lying across the back of the seats at the very time, you know, this was going on. And that was likewise before they reached the triple underpass, whereas, of course, all we see in the Zapruder film is him on the back step and also in a photograph that is also, it appears, faked, the Alchin 7, so-called, uh, which is at the back of the limo as it's heading toward the motorcade where he's still standing. It's, it's just amazing the extent to which they've gone to fake and fabricate all this. I mean, practically all of our efforts... Uh, since I organized a research group in 1992 consisting of the best qualified individuals to ever study the case, have been devoted to sorting out the authentic from the inauthentic to evidence, Chuck. I mean, you know, what, once you do that, actually, it's relatively obvious what happened. Well, yeah, it seems that way. <laughs> you know, it does seem that way. But, again, you know, I, I can't – let's see. How can I, how can I put this? I can't say that I agree with every single uh, 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 thing you, you, you've said about about this stuff, and I'll tell you why. I, I've seen different versions of things that, you know, when you're dealing with certain copies of things, it's hard to know if you're dealing with an artifact of the copy or if you're dealing with an artifact of the optics or what have you. Now, some things are quite obviously tampered with. You know, like I said, uh, you know, when you're looking at uh, the observation of, uh, of Dr. Mantic about that letter T, there's no other explanation for that other than you're looking at a copy. Uh, now, there could be a benign explanation for why there's a copy, but I somehow doubt that. Well, the, the, but Chuck, look, we know that JFK was hit four times. He was hit in the throat by a bullet that passed through the windshield. It was described three different times as a wound of entry by Malcolm Perry during the Parkland press conference. I published a transcript in Assassination Science. Chuck Crenshaw drew a diagram of it. It was widely broadcast on radio and television that day. Uh, we know he was shot in the throat. Uh, we also know he was hit in the back. There's uh, holes in the shirt, the jacket. There's a mark in the Boswell's autopsy diagram. We have Siebert O'Neill's sketch, which shows the wound to the back lower than the wound to the throat. We have Merkley's death certificate located at the level of the third thoracic vertebrae. We have multiple reenactment photographs showing a large patch located at that location. We know that Gerald Ford actually had the wound changed from his uppermost back, which was an exaggeration, to the base of the back of the neck. In order Which to make is a funny thing because when you're looking at those reenactment photographs with the patch, uh, some of them feature uh, an interesting individual holding a pointer yeah. uh, that we're all very familiar yeah. with named Arlen Specter, right? Who That's... was, you know, the author of the single uh, of the single bullet theory. But here's the funny part: he's using a pointer exactly pointing to a spot from the one angle. I don't know if you've ever seen the reverse angle. There, there's a generally available angle where it's hard to discern exactly where that spot is, but then there's the reverse angle of the very same pose, which is not widely published, where you can see precisely where that patch is and how low it is, and he is using a pointer to basically refute his own single bullet theory. Well, the yeah, I put it differently, I say. I mean, it's my favorite photograph from the archives because here he is demonstrating the single bullet theory, and when you look below his hand to see the location of the patch, a photograph that's supposed to illustrate the magic bullet theory actually refutes it. And, of course, exactly. Mantic is demonstrated by taking a patient with similar chest and neck dimensions to JFK and plotting, creating a CAT scan, and then plotting the purported trajectory, which isn't even physically possible because cervical vertebrae is intervened. So we know those two, sh two wounds occurred. Then we have the head wound. Many physicians at Parkland uh, described the fist-sized blowout at the back of the head that I've already mentioned that Clint Hill described. 
his wounds were blow his brains were blown out to the left rear. They hit Officer Hargis so hard, and he initially thought he himself had been shot. It entered the right temple, was fired from the right front, just as the bullet that passed through the windshield appears to have been fired from the above ground sewer opening halfway between the roadway and the top of the triple underpass on the south side. This shot appears to have been fired from the same symmetrically located uh, halfway between the roadway and the top of the triple underpass sewer opening on the on the north side. And then, of course, what's, what's, and, and this is, of course, the wound and all that that David corroborated by the optical densitometry, and he found the indications of metallic fragments that had uh, uh, arisen from that shot because it was a frangible or exploding bullet. And then, and this is very, very interesting, the wound to the back of the head, which the Bethesda physicians reported, which was in the vicinity of the external occipital protuberance, uh, ha ha has been confirmed by David that there's some smudge on a fragment of bone, I, it may even be the Harper fragment, that has the beveling on the inside. So he actually has been able to establish that there was that second shot to the head, which he was already discussing, of course, in, uh, in assassination science. So I don't think there's any doubt about those four shots, Chuck. I mean, we have uh, ballistic, medical, photographic evidence, x-rays, and all that when you sort it out that all converge on those four shots. Then you got Connolly, who's shot in the back, shatters a rib, comes out his chest, goes into his right wrist, winds up in his thigh. Uh, Robert Shaw, MD, who dealt with his wrist, uh, was very skeptical of the so-called magic bullet because he explained he'd remove more metal from Connolly's wrist than was missing from that bullet. Since we know that the throat wound was a wound of entry and the back wound was way too low, shallow shot, only went in about as far as the second knuckle on your little finger at a downward angle, we know there was no magic bullet, therefore there was no bullet that went into the back of Connolly, therefore we have to account for the wound to the throat and all the wounds in Connolly on the basis of other shots and other shooters so that we already have a proof of conspiracy simply by locating where JFK was hit in the back which was the point of my presentation in Cambridge, entitled Reasoning About Assassinations, which was published in a peer-reviewed international journal. So, I, you know, there aren't a whole lot of articles about JFK that have been through that kind of vetting, but this is one that all by itself proves the existence of a conspiracy. Well, I, I found it interesting when I spoke, because I, I spoke to, uh, I was only able to speak to one of the Parkland doctors myself, and that was Dr. McClellan. Okay, good. And uh, when I did, now, I, I found, see, this is where it, it gets a little odd because, you know, when you're dealing with people's recollections many years later, uh, it's, you know, because it was only a few years ago that I spoke to him, so, you know, minimally you're talking about 45 years uh, after the fact, uh, you know, but he will never forget what he saw. And even though he seemed to indicate to me that there was a way, that you could orient things and it would make sense for the neck wound to be the exit wound and all that, which I don't personally believe. But I was, you know, taking what he was saying into account. You were listening to him, yeah. Yeah. You know, I try not to interfere with, uh, with guys that were firsthand witnesses so that they tell me what it is they want to tell me first, you know. Uh, I'm not saying that I have any sort of a great interviewing technique. Yeah, I mean, yeah I, but what's important about him isn't the wound to the throat. It's the back of the head wound, which he described it, so vividly to an artist and a priest, which was published in Six Seconds in Dallas. Right, but, but not only that, but when he was talking to me himself, you know, because you remember in 1988 they had brought the, uh, the Parkland doctors, uh, the, the television show Nova brought the Parkland doctors to uh, look at the the photographs in the National Archives. Yes. And in general, on the Nova show, they basically say, well, no, that's about right. That's about right. <laughs> but, Chuck, uh, we don't know which photographs they were being shown. Well, the, well, this is the thing. But when I talked to him about this, okay, because I just wanted to see what his view was on it, it is the only thing that he said that really disturbed him there was that the back of the head was not correct at all. It just didn't resemble it at all. And he said that at first he had thought that perhaps they had pulled up the scalp over the wound in order to show the uh, the damage to the scalp. Because as you know, later on in the uh, in the photographs, there was the, uh, the scalp being reflected and then were shown the bone quite vividly in what a lot of people refer to as the mystery photograph that uh, 
Yeah. That our that our friend Dr. Bodden there couldn't quite properly orient in front of the house. Yeah, of David. Dave, David's done the best work on that. Man, it, well, exactly. I, I keep going back to him because he's definitely been uh, one of the primary people I've looked at as far as studying the medical evidence. Yeah. And uh, and uh, as you say, you know, he is definitely one of the leading experts on the case in the world right now. And uh, and I certainly uh, defer to him on on most things here. So the thing is that uh, when he was talking about that, though, he said that that is the that is the oddity there. That is oddity. The, he should be it, outraged. I mean, it didn't look anything like the wound that they described. But see, that is the odd thing to me is that he's not saying, "Look, that's absolutely wrong." He's yeah. sort of making, uh, sort of like qualifying it so that it wasn't, you know, well. Perhaps they were holding up the scalp, and maybe this was this. Which maybe, is all ridiculous, but he maybe wants to stay alive. I mean, he's got to be aware how many witnesses have been bumped off. Well, precisely. But anything that he, that he has to say now, I don't think you know anybody would would go after him nowadays. But I think. Oh, Chuck, push. I wouldn't take I wouldn't take that for granted. Well, it just seems like that to me. But the thing is that uh, it's a nice it, thought, but I'm not I'm not sure it's true. Well, then perhaps I'm being too optimistic. But the fact is that. Uh, that, that his recollections and his re- relation of these of these events now to me is going to be, you know, definitely tainted and and injured throughout the years. He's got to sort of apologize for some of it, you know, in a way in his own mind it seems. Yeah. And I'm I'm making assumptions here that I shouldn't even make anyway because I can't be inside the guy's head. But the fact is that just by him trying to tell me what he was seeing, there's still, even with all those years having passed, and even if you're absolutely correct and he should be afraid for his life, he's still not able to just say, no, that's absolutely the way it was. He's still telling us the truth in a way. Chuck, Chuck we got to take our second break. This is Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal, with my very special guest today, Charles O'Chelly. This is uh, Jim Fetzer, your host, continuing my conversation with Charles Ocelli. Uh, Chuck, uh, we were talking about the shots and all that, and I was explaining how we know there were four shots to Jack. Uh, and, of course, uh, Big John was hit with at least one in the back and possibly as many as two others, so somewhere from one to three there, and then there were three shots that missed. The one that hit the distant Kirby and injured James Tague, uh, the one that missed and hit the chrome strip over the windshield, and then the one that missed it was found in the grass on the left side of the limousine. So it seems to me we have four plus one to three plus three, so we have as many as eight to ten shots fired altogether from what appear to have been six different locations. Yeah, I... I have a mildly different count because uh, I do discount one of those shots that you had there, but then again, I think that it's very possible that Connolly was hit with one bullet. Uh, well, I, I said think, one to three. That's why I said eight to ten. Yeah. I'm only assuming at least one, but there may have been as many as three. See, the angles of the trajectories for the wrist and the thigh are just quite different, you know, than the back. The, the, and the idea that, you know, the magic bullet is, of course, preposterous. I mean, no, that's preposterous, but the fact that Connolly could have been wounded with one bullet isn't. Uh, I think that based on his his particular orientation, when you take uh, Kennedy out of the equation, he could have very possibly been hit, uh, even from the school book depository. That's a possibility, yeah. although I tend to think that it was from the other end of the building. Yes, yes, uh, I, we agree on that. I actually think that uh, as many as three shots were fired at him from that location. But I agree that, you know, you got at least the one. He talked about turning to his right, and he couldn't see what was going on, so he turned back to his left, and he said that's when he felt this doubling up in his chest. Right, and and very characteristic, he did not hear the shot that hit him. Right. Uh, another thing is with, with Tag being struck, and I recently spoke to him. He's an interesting guy to speak to. Uh, he, uh, I, I, I think that he may have actually been hit by a fragment. Uh, of a bullet which was split off from somewhere else. So I don't think that was a separate shot. I think that that is the wildly missed shot uh, that was definitely not even from the uh, the supposed Oswald location. But uh, well, I know, actually, yeah, I don't believe any shots were fired from the sixth floor alleged assassin's lair. I mean, the three up here to have been fired from the Dow Tax by that. Uh, you know, the window in the, the the closet of the uranium mining company that's bracketed by the fire escape, the shot to Jack's back from the top of the county records building, 
and and you know it does appear to have been a shot fired by Badge Man, who was right there on the grassy knoll. There may even been one other shot from the from the grassy knoll, or even behind the picket fence. Well, the third floor of the Dow Tex building, where now uh, the there's now an atrium there. That's all been redone. I don't know if you're aware of that, but they they uh, did a whole lot of renovations to that. Did building, they actually. now? Just in time for the fiftieth observance. Oh, it was a couple of years ago, but yeah, it, it, there there's absolutely no way to line that up from from a physical standpoint anymore. <clears throat> but when I was trying to look at that. I've got to tell you that the window of opportunity for shots to have come from there is is a lot more limited than uh, than some people realize because the car which was behind Kennedy uh, was was higher up than his, which you note. Uh, I, I remember you noting it in one of your presentations where you were stating they were using it for the reenactment. I'm pretty sure. Oh, the Cadillac, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, and that that was physically higher up. Plus, there were Secret Service guys uh, sitting on the back of that car. Uh, in a way that would have blocked <laughs> if they were even remotely in that position. Well, it depends where they were in relation to one another. Yes, there, there's a good question there of how close they were to JFK's vehicle. Right, and then when you take the uh, the two degree uh, uh, slope, which I think um, uh, John Costello nailed down for me finally, was if, if you take all that into account, there's a very limited window as to when Kennedy could have been struck from that particular position. So I'm not sure about that third floor, but the Daltex building is certainly uh, a viable location. But that that third floor, I'm a little bit a little bit skeptical of. But um, before we go any further, though, I just want to say something about about you personally, because you know a lot of people don't uh, don't have guys on their shows that disagree with them in any way, shape, or form. And my appearance today actually started with a, a, a disagreeing email with you. <laughs> And uh, I just want to say that, you know, it does take uh, a, a bit of, oh, gee, I don't know what kind of language we can use here, but it, it, take, it, takes a <laughs> bit of, it takes a bit of a pair to have somebody on who you know is going to disagree with you some. And so I just want to say that, you know, some of the, uh, the criticisms that others have had of you about not listening to other points of view and all this kind of thing, uh, I'm, I am proof positive today that, uh, that you're not uh, afraid to, deal with somebody who has a disagreement with you. So well, I just want that known to the listening audience. Well, I appreciate that, Chuck. I mean, it was because I thought you had reasons for your differences with me that I found you interesting. I mean, anybody can disagree with anyone, but they can't all have good reasons for doing that. And it seemed to me that you were a serious person, which has obviously been corroborated by what you've had to say here today. So I'm real pleased that it worked out. Yeah, well, no, but I just I just want to know I just wanted you to know that I appreciate it, and I want your audience to know that uh, if they are told things that you know, well, Fetzer's not afraid to uh, Fetzer's afraid to deal with people that disagree with him or whatever else. Uh, you're you're incorrect. <laughs> so. Yeah, actually, I'm quite the opposite. I, I I I you know I mean I prefer to deal with people who disagree with me because then there's a point to having the, the, the difference of opinion ex expanded and elaborated and uh, dissected. I mean, persons who agree with me, really, there's not a whole lot to talk about except to review the bidding. So, you know, I'm, I'd rather have people with whom there is a disagreement. Typically, on this show, or at least very often, I have people who know a great deal more about some subject or other than do I. So, you know, I, I, I usually learn quite a lot by having people on to talk about the the Fed or the, or, or the Middle East or who knows what, you know, even though I do a, a lot about the Middle East and so forth. The, all the economic stuff is just stunning to me because it's so terribly important, yet so few Americans have any comprehension of it at all. Well, it's so, it's so uh, entirely complex, you know, that uh, it, it's very much like the JFK case. It, when, when people like yourself and myself dissect things, to such a degree, it becomes overwhelming to a lot of the general public. You know, they want uh, you know a specific. Well, did the mob do it? Did the CIA do it? Did Oswald do it? That's all they want. They don't necessarily want to hear the uh, the minutia. Let's just say of, of of how it is you can prove these things or how yeah. it is you can disprove these things. Yeah. And uh, often it's the and and I think that this is purposely done again. 
uh, as with uh, as with 9/11, as with uh, the Vietnam War itself. Uh, you know, the, the fact that that was started, uh, you know, based on a false flag operation. Yeah. Uh, you know, people don't realize these things, and they don't want to look at them very deeply in some cases, but yeah. they do want the answers. Well, why don't we, yeah, why don't we explore one of those areas where I think you have some differences uh, in, in opinion with me, which uh, includes uh, Alchin 6. I mentioned Alchin 7, which I don't believe Alchin's even took. I mean, a fake photograph. No one takes a fake photograph. Just as the Pruder cannot have taken the Zapruder film because no one takes a fake film. The film was taken and resource uses a resource in creating a new version, which is what we have available today. And we know this for a host of reasons, including what Clint Hill has had to tell us, which I address in Who's Telling the Truth, Clint Hill or the Zapruder film. But there is this very interesting question that has arisen about the uh, Alchin 6, which everyone will recall is the broad perspective panorama, the Dow Techs in the background, the book depository to the left, we're looking right at the limousine, Jack's clutching his throat, Secret Service men are looking around, where the issue has arisen over the identity of the person who seems to be extending his neck out to see what's going on there in the doorway, who is now being referred to as doorman or doorway man, and where mm -hmm. the question of his identity is really uh, resurrecting a very old much disputed issue from the past, where no less an expert than Oliver Stone concluded, based upon his analysis, that it was indeed Billy Lovelady, which of course is the official account. But where, when I discovered that the ARRB had actually located Will Fritz's interview notes, and that Lee Oswald had told him that he was out with Bill Shelley in front, that led me to take a whole nother look at the Alchins. And I found, of all places, on a John McAdams website, a composite, that brought together the man in the checkered shirt, Billy Lovelady wearing a checkered shirt, other images, but most importantly, a close-up of Doorman where you could see the, the man to his right front facing him, to his left front, from his point of view, has had his face obscured which led me to the inference that that uh, had probably been Lee, because surely they wouldn't have, you know, altered the Alchins for any less serious purpose than if someone had been there or shouldn't have been there, and the only person that could have been was Lee Oswald. So I actually published that uh, composite from the website of John McAdams with that image circled in a recent article of mine entitled JFK, What We Know Now That We Didn't Know Then. And Rouse and Kay, who happens to be a chiropractor, who had been looking at this question, wrote to me to say he thought I had the right conclusion to wit that Oswald was there, but that I had mistaken who it was, and that he'd been studying the shirt, clothing, body build, and so forth, and was quite certain that it was actually Doorman who was Oswald, and not the fellow who had his face obfuscated which led to quite an elaborate exchange. I mean, he actually gave reasons that I found quite convincing and caused me to change my mind and to agree with him. And now, uh, Chuck, for the only time uh, I can recall, I published five articles about this topic. Uh, J as JFK special, Oswald was in the doorway after all, uh, two, three, four, five. So you can find those all on Veterans Today, and I take it. Some of what we did there is part of why you had written me in the first place to raise objections. Well, my, my initial objections were really over things that I, that I felt you had allowed a guest to say, and I don't even want to point people to that interview because it's just uh, it was badly done on the guest part, and I just even you had admitted that in a way you had kind of uh, fell asleep at the wheel a little bit there and not challenge certain things that he Oh, said. yeah, 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 yeah. That was a bizarre interview. Yeah, I know what you mean. You can mention it. It. It, was, yeah. it. it was the interview with Lenny Bloom. Oh, okay. Well, the, the thing is, it kind of went into some very strange directions, and I was quite shocked yeah. that you didn't challenge him on some things, and I said, well, and I've heard this guy before, and he often has a, quite a mix of stuff that just we know is provably incorrect, and it just seems well. to me that that's... I, you know that that was kind of like just a rough. That was just a rough show for you. you know? Well, I, yeah, it was not long after I got back from the Vancouver hearings, and for some reason, I don't know, I felt like I was sleepwalking through that interview because normally, you know, I'm very, very attentive and responsive if somebody offers a 
a fanciful story or something that I'm quite convinced is wrong. And in that case, I was just sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, stupefied, uh, s s sleeping through it. I don't know what. I've even said so in my comments about the show on the Real Deal archive. So, you know, right, that, right. That, was a, that was a very odd interview for me, Chuck, and very uncharacteristic, and I can't really account for it. Yeah, that, that was just, listen, we all have our days. It happens. Uh, but, okay, to, to discuss the, the photograph, though, yeah, that was one of the issues I brought up to you because I said to you, well, I disagree with you on some things, and you said, okay, be specific. I said, all right, and uh, that was one of them. And, and the reason is this. Um, I have – now, th this is what I will say because somebody pointed out to me that, uh, that I may have a, a minor logical flaw here, and that is that simply because I am examining what I think is – a legitimate photograph doesn't mean that I couldn't be fooled by its, you know, authenticity. I'm no expert on its authenticity, let's just say. But as authentic as I could get, in my little hands anyways, was the one of the photographs which had been circulated that weekend, uh, because as you know, they used to do this by wire and also uh, by, uh, by delivery where they would uh, send out massive packets of photographs to news organizations, right? So one of those original prints I got my hands on, and I started going through it to see who is actually in the doorway, because this issue, as you've said, has been brought up for a long time, uh, most famously originally by, uh, I think, Harold Weisberg brought it up first. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and he quite honestly thought that it was Oswald in the doorway. And using the prints that, that Weisberg was using and using the prints that I've seen on the, on the Internet, you could very reasonably conclude that that is Oswald there. However, when I look at the closest thing to the original photograph, as far as my understanding goes, that I could get my hands on, what I see, and I can even see uh, an individual standing behind Doorway Man there in the doorway pretty clearly which uh, 